Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about uh, control flow analysis. So if you don't recall, uh, control flow analysis is a compile time approximation of the flow of functions in a program. So Yuri just talked about the flow of security values. We're saying more generally the flow of functions. So we might, we're interested in figuring out which functions might be bound to a given variable at runtime. You know, so this is an enabling analysis for a lot of implementation techniques in functional languages. Because in a functional language, it's not syntactically apparent the way it is in C what function you're calling at this point, right? It's f applied to x. What function might f be bound to? However, if you go and look at the control flow literature, the thing that I've observed is it's typically formulated just for dynamically or simply type languages. That's great for, for a lot of functional languages, but if you look out at the world, the popular statically type functional languages are richly typed. In particular, they've got polymorphism. And furthermore, if you look at implementation, that is to say, the compilers in which one might employ uh, control flow analysis, they're using system F and extensions thereof um, as an intermediate language. So this seems to suggest to me that what we really need to do is find a control flow analysis that's formulated for system F. And one of the motivations that we might uh, here, so one of the things that we might try to uh, take advantage of here is that if we're in a statically and virtually typed language like system F, we're going to only be interested in analyzing well-typed terms. And so hopefully that well-typedness can help us improve our control flow analysis a little bit with respect to what we might get out of a dynamically or simply typed language. So let me give you a little bit of intuition as to why I think here we can, we can do something better once we have some types available to us. So here's a trivial, trivial little program. Here's what happens if you run the zeroth order control flow analysis on this. So again, if you haven't seen this before, what, we're, what the result of our analysis is, is an abstract you know, environment that tells me for every variable in the program, what functions or values might be bound to that variable. And so in this particular case, we can see that the identity functions apply to both f1 and f2, which means that x must take on the values both f1 and f2. That's why here we've got f1 and f2. And in a zero CFA, we're losing all context information. It's a completely context insensitive one. So whatever flowed into ID is also flowing out of ID at all of its current, uh, at all of its application points. So res1 and res2 are both, you know, uh, possibly f1 and f2. Right, so this is well, this is the approximation we're making because we want a uh, analysis that terminates, but my source program might potentially be non-terminating, so we have to make uh, allowances. But now let me suppose that I'm in system F. So I don't have just the identity function, I have the polymorphic identity functions, and I have to do type applications. And now I stare at my results here, and I say, hey look, oh, res1, you told me statically was of type int arrow int, but my analysis says that a bool arrow bool function might flow there. And similarly for res2, we've got the opposite. So just staring at this result, I can clearly say in a well-typed program, f2 is never going to appear in res1. The types just don't make sense. Right? So I can imagine doing something like, OK, run a completely type agnostic uh, control flow analysis, then go back and filter out the things that don't make sense. Okay. But I suggest that we can do even better than that. All right, so the code here, I don't want to get into. Let's say that in a larger enough you know, context, I get this you know, bit of uh, 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 analysis out of zero CFA. So if I just stare at this and then try my type filtering technique, I get nothing out of it. Right? So int arrow int, all of these things are int arrow int. Here, we've got type variables coming into play. So I've got a beta arrow int arrow int. Well, OK, this could be you know, something in our end, something in our end, something in our end. Nothing you know, up front tells me you know, I should throw any of those things away. Okay. But you pause for another moment and you think, hey, I'm in system F. There's something else that's kind of flowing around the program as a system F program is running, namely types. Right? We've got type applications going on. Right. Not only think of erasing them, but in, in some sense they're going on. So what I like to do is say, if I give you some additional information, namely that, for example, beta can only ever take on the types into bool in this program, then this guy becomes suspect. Right? I've got 
a string arrow int arrow int function flowing to something that is of static type beta arrow int arrow int, but I told you that beta is only in symbols. So clearly, if that's if, if this information is correct about my program, then f3 can't possibly flow to ff. Okay? And if I compute all this information and now do my you know, filtering, yeah, I throw this one away. But what uh, you know you have to do to you have to watch the uh, look, look at the code a little more closely. It turns out that if I throw f3 out of here, I should also throw g3 out because g3 is in some sense the, a sub you know a piece of, of f in the way this code works. So the analysis that I'm going to try to talk about today computes this additional information and then uses this information to improve my control flow analysis. Okay. So I want to call this. Uh, point a term here and call the second you know, bit of information type flow now analysis. Right? By way of analogy, this is a compile time approximation of the flow of types in the program. In particular, I'm interested in which types might be bound to type variables at one time. Okay. And then the key thing that I think makes this very interesting is that these two flows are mutually beneficial in a particular sense. So let me explain this direction first. So the control flow analysis tells me which functions flow to which points. And in particular, in system F, it's going to tell me which type abstractions, that is big lambda functions, flow to which type applications. And that's the information I need to know what types flow to type variables. Then this direction is what we just did on the, that previous slide. Use that information about which types flow to which type variables to in some sense reject flows that are incompatible with that static typing. Refine your control flow information. And in the best of worlds, these two things you know, are mutually beneficial. We throw away some more things. That tells me that fewer type abstractions flow to a place. I get better type information, and we can go around here. Those in the know, we don't actually go down the lattice. We're going to go up the lattice, but, but that's the idea. Yeah. All right, so let's build this you know, pretty quickly. So the language I'm going to work in is system F. I've done it in administrative normal form just because I'm in a compiler and just because it'll make some things easier. Um, of course, um, as we talked earlier, strong, system F is strongly normalizing. I want something a little bit uh, beefier, so I've actually got recursive functions and recursive you know, type uh, abstractions. Uh, so uh, both of my small lambdas and big lambdas are always embedded inside recursive functions. And I've got you know, applications and uh, type applications. Type system is completely standard. I'm not going to bother showing you anything about that. Um, the operational semantics, which I would need, I'll need to just you know, mention in passing in order to, to state my soundness result, um, I'm going to present as a variation on uh, the uh, CA, you know, the ANF uh, EK abstract machine. So this is an environment-based abstract machine. Uh, rather than a substitution-based uh, operational semantics. And that's typical for you know, expressing uh, control flow analyses. Uh, the one thing that I do want to mention here is that operationally, we're not doing an erasure. We're actually going to pass types around at runtime. And we're not going to substitute types. We're actually going to you know, sort of treat types the same way we treat closures. That is to say, we will pair up at runtime a syntactic type with a type environment to represent you know, a, a runtime type rather than performing the substitution. Can I ask a question about that? Well, why isn't the, the recursive new type part of the type of syntax? So I don't have recursive types. I, this is a recursive function. Oh, F is a recursive. Yeah, so, so F is the function itself you know, in, by name you know, inside the body. So think of this as random. All right, so what's uh, my control flow analysis? So you saw, saw a preview of this before. We're going to end up with two environments. Hat row um, is my sort of typical abstract environment. It's a mapping from variables to sets of abstract values. In this very simple setting, my abstract values are just uh, syntactic you know, at, uh, functions, either small lambdas or big lambdas, you know, in this case, recursive. Similarly, I've got this abstract type environment, which is a mapping from type variables to sets of abstract types. 
Again, in this very simple setting, my abstract types are pretty simple. They are just the syntactic types that appeared in my program. Okay. So what my control flow analysis is going to, how I'm going to express it, is that as the following judgment that said, these abstract environments are an acceptable type and control flow analysis for E. So we're thinking of this as a specification. Right? So when I show you these judgment, uh, these inference rules, think of this in the sort of guess and check mode. I guess a pair of abstract environments that I think are you know, good for this program. These rules will let you check to see whether or not they were good. We'll talk you know, later about how to turn that into an algorithm. So the first three rules are really simple. Right? So it's syntax directed, so I'm just going to crawl over the syntax of my program. Uh, variables sort of, I have nothing to show about a particular variable. For recursive functions and recursive uh, big lambdas, they're basically exactly the same. It's recursive, right? So the whole function itself flows to the uh, variable f. Clearly, it's in a binding, which means the whole function flows to uh, the left bound x. And then we just recursively check the body and check the body of the left. Body function, body function. Do exactly the same thing in the big lambda. There's nothing, there's nothing special going on here. Okay. So the following is exactly what we would do in a zero order CFA if we weren't interested in types at all. So here what we're doing is we've got an application. X sub f applied to x sub f. So what I want to do is look at all of the functions that appear, you know, could possibly flow to x sub f. For each of them, everything that might flow to x sub a flows to z, flows to the formal variable of my function. And everything that flows out of the body flows into x. So this last uh, uh, function is just a syntax, uh, you know, syntax directed function that just cutters down e sub b to the last variable and said, well, what flows out of the body is whatever flows uh, out of that last variable. Okay, so this is completely, you know, scanned. Pretty much the same thing goes on down here, except what we're doing is we're saying this is a type application, so look at all the big lambdas that are in x sub f. For each of them, make sure that the type tau sub a flows to b and the body e sub b flows to b. Okay, so that's gives me the type flow, that is to say, you give me some information about what types flow where, but it doesn't do any of that filtering that we were talking about before. All right, so if I want to throw in filtering, it gets a little bit more complicated, but all this is is saying, hey, those big sets, throw some stuff out of them. Okay? So in particular, at this application, not everything that's bound to x sub a might flow to z, because Sometimes the types might not work out. In particular, I'm interested in only the abstract values, w sub a, that are compatible with the static type of uh, z, tau sub z. And then similarly, when I run this thing, all the values that flow out of the end of the body have to be compatible with the static type of the uh, value variable that's being bound to. Again, same thing's going on down here, we just, except in this case, we just have the body case. So now I can tell you a little bit about these judgments, but they're pretty uh, straightforward. So the first is the type of an abstract value, W, is compatible with an abstract type under the type flowing uh, environment that you have a uh, hassle fee. In this case, it turns out that I can extract the type of my abstract values trivially because I annotated uh, the recursive function with its own type. Uh, so it turns out that's very simple. I just pass our, our work off to uh, the compatibil compatibility judgment. So this asks, are, tau, uh, are, are two abstract types compatible under uh, phi? All right, and this is essentially, they have to be structurally compatible. If one of them's a variable, I can unroll that variable to one of its constituent types and make sure that it's compatible or vice versa, you know, in the other direction. This extra junk is to avoid some confusion between for all bound type variables, 
which should only ever be compatible with themselves and never compatible with other type variables. I should really use De Bruyne indices or something here to make, make this a little bit uh, simpler. But the key idea here is at the point where there's a type variable, I, I roll it a little bit according to one of the possible uh, ways that um, it's. Okay, so we've got some standard results here. So the most important result that we're interested in is flow sounds. That acceptable abstract environments approximate concrete en environments. Right? So essentially what this says is you give me a well-typed program and, a sound, uh, and an acceptable analysis, you run that program for a little bit, well, your uh, uh, abstract environments approximate any of the concrete environments that come up. And the key thing that we need is that under the right conditions, this judgment is derivable. That is to say, we have two compatible types. And essentially, no surprise, because we're in a because I'm trying to use the types to do that, is the well type in this that you know, kicks this off and makes sure that this lemma goes through. So, you know, sort of hearing I mentioned before, there are best, you know, analyses. So there's the best acceptable abstract environments. You know, there's a minimum one, that's the one that we're actually interested in. Not so interested in the, in the proof here. But I am interested in another question. <coughs> Can I actually compute these? Right? Analysis is not so good if I can't actually produce that minimum one for you. So before answering that question, let's think of a, a simpler one. Can I even ch check? Can I even do the guess and check in a decidable manner? And here's the tricky part. To show that you know, I've got a pair of acceptable environments, I've got to do a bunch of these inclusions. And if these, you know, if I've actually done some filtering, then I have to have you know, something that's in you know, the abstract environment for X, but not in the abstract environment for Z. And I have to show that this thing is not derivable. And that's what's justifying the filter. So is type compatibility decided? If I give you two types in an abstract environment, can you to tell me whether or not you know, I can derive that judgment? So the tricky thing here is recursion might appear in this abstract environment. Note that this thing says that it could go to int arrow alpha itself, and this thing says that beta could go to int arrow beta. So there's this recursion here. So if I just try to exhaustively enumerate you know, sort of all the potential derivations, I run into the classic problem, and I start unfolding this, and I get back where I started. That's not good for your search. So it turns out, and there's more details about this in the paper, what I can do is I can interpret this abstract type environment as a regular tree grammar, reduction in there. Okay, so think of it like a grammar. It turns out it has a little bit more structure. And so the key thing is if I think of all of the terms that are generated by that grammar, starting from this term, I get a bunch of closed types. This one produces a different set of closed types. And it turns out that there are no closed types in common. And that's the key you know, idea. Intuitively, this judgment is not derivable because there's no closed type that's uh, generated from both of those starting type terms. And in a system that program, we only actually are running with closed type. Anytime any term actually does something, it's with a closed type. So if there's no closed type, it can't possibly be running. So it turns out that regular tree grammars are closed under intersection, and the emptiness of regular tree grammars is, is decidable. So I can show that there's an equivalence between the, the intersection, or the non emptiness of their intersection, um, and the type compatibility judgment. That gives me my uh, analysis. So then these things are computable exactly you know, as you're in invention. We have a least fixed point, we compute it you know, via iteration. Okay. So I want to spend just the, the end mentioning a little bit of related work here. So one of the things I, I need to do with related work is distinguish between 
a very large body of literature that has flow analyses expressed as sophisticated type systems. And what, as far as I can tell, is a very small body of literature, which is flow analyses of languages with sophisticated type systems. And so these things that use sophisticated type systems to express the analysis, the underlying language is just simply typed. So there's two that I'm particularly that I think are particularly co close. Um, Jagannath and Beeson Wright had a paper in SAS 97 where they limited themselves to predicative system F um, with recursion. Um, they gave a polyvariance analysis, but the big you know, uh, you know, sticking point for them was their analysis diverged on programs that use polymorphic recursion. Um, and for those of you, you know, who mentioned polymorphic recursion earlier today, if you've been watching the talks, you've seen various occurrences of it in programs. This is getting more and more popular. So it seems like we really ought to have analyses that are you know, robust in the face of it. Uh, John Reckley a few years ago gave a, another kind of variation on this idea of trying to use types to filter the, the control flow analysis. Um, and he was working in ML. You know, the main body of his paper focused on a simply typed language. He sort of added you know, sort of a, a comment that said, oh yeah, ML has polymorphism. Well, we'll just treat you know, any polymorphic type as top. Um, so you sort of lose all you know, precision you know, there. So it's this sort of unsatisfying. Okay, so that's, oh, uh, some future work. So this iterative solution is not the way one typically solves the standard zero, zero CFA. So one of the things I'm interested in doing is figuring out, can I, do, can I adopt some of the constraint solving you know, techniques to solve uh, this analysis? Constraint solving techniques are, are fairly sensitive to the exact form of your constraints. This filtering here, that I've got going on here that's also dependent on the analysis that you're computing means that I think it's going to be a little bit trickier than, than sort of a straightforward adaptation. Um, we might be interested in extending this to a polyvariant type and control flow analysis. Um, and ultimately, where I'd like to go with this is extend it to even richer type systems, uh, you know, up to something like system F omega, because if you actually look at something like GHC, that's really the intermediate language that they've got going on in there. Um, and it's, you know, we're also obviously looking at a, a somewhat higher yield level, so we might really be interested in, that, in tackling that kind of thing. Okay. Thanks very much. You have a soundless result, right? Yes. So that, that shows that the analysis is sound with respect to some kind of semantic criteria. Yes, correct. Is it conceivable or inconceivable that there exists an analysis that is more expressive, which means like more precise than yours and cheaper to compute? Conceivable, yeah. So so right, so this is why we phrase this as the judgment, you know, I say these are acceptable. I don't say that these are sound, right? Because either these are not everything that's sound is necessarily um, uh, uh, derivable via the, that judgment, right? So it certainly it could be you know, more. So you have you have one in mind? No, but, <laughs> okay. but, but I just like to point out this is a provocative question because if yes. there is if there is uh, if there is such an analysis. <coughs> that is better and cheaper to compute than yours, you have an explanation problem. So in other words, I'm asking, I'm asking for an argument that says that you're approximating a problem that might be very hard in the semantic limit, very often it's undecidable, to compute. But you, you better have, a, you, I, I'd like to, see, I'd be interested if there's an argument that says that whatever you're producing, in terms of information, it is sound, but it cannot be beaten by anything that doesn't require at least as many computational resources. So I think that's great, but so as far as I can tell, looking at the literature, I don't know what, much of that even for. Oh, the literature is filled with, with soundless results and nobody actually addressing, or very few people addressing that issue. Absolutely. But there is actually, if you look at it carefully, there is actually analyses that uh, can be written. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Right. So soundness is not sufficient for a good analysis. It's absolutely not. So, so intu intuitively, 
you know, or, you know, sort of an off the cuff justification. People have gone quite far with zero CFA. This is zero CFA and a little bit better. Right, so as, as I formulated, it's exactly zero CFA with some extra constraints. So sort of by construction, it's going to be no worse than zero CFA and potentially better. So in practice, I think you know, we can do something with this. Is it the best? Absolutely not. You know, um, and I'd really be interested in fine tuning you know, exactly you know, where this lies in, in the various spectrums. But it's still polynomial, right? I, uh, as far as, yeah, so the iterative loop is a big polynomial. In, in the innermost loop, you've got some uh, kind of polynomial. See the paper for some intuition that I don't actually have to do all of this work at every point in the innermost iteration. But yes, I, will, I believe it's polynomial. So your selling point might be, uh, I can do better than zero CFA, or this is good as zero CFA, and stay on the stay on the That's that's so certainly one CFA is exponential. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, above, above zero CFA is exponential. That's a, that's a good point, thanks. <laughs> okay, let's thank Matthew again.